<clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm Ralph Hexter. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor here at UC Davis, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Chancellor's Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series 2011-12. Uh, the Chancellor's Colloquium is one of our favorite ways to share research at UC Davis by bringing national policymakers and intellectual innovators into meaningful dialogue with Davis faculty, students, and community members, the colloquium highlights the rich array of expertise and creativity across the disciplines at UC Davis. Throughout each year, UC Davis hosts renowned leaders in government, industry, and higher education in a series of talks and public fora designed to engage the campus community in compelling conversations. We're especially intent on exploring how the work we do here at UC Davis has a direct impact on global issues of pressing concern. This year's Distinguished Speaker Series comes from a broad range of fields, humanities, science, and engineering, but they all have something important in common. All contribute to a new vision for university-based research and a commitment to transforming that vision into real-world contributions. It's clear that charting our collective course in this century and beyond will require us to address a wide array of complex concerns. For this task, UC Davis offers not only our long-standing expertise in research and education, but also the benefit of innovative models of interdisciplinary collaboration. As one of the top research universities in the United States and a uniquely comprehensive one, UC Davis is ideally positioned to bring diverse disciplines together to pursue innovative research and education that will help us shape our global future. UC Davis, as you all know, is deeply committed to cutting edge research and excellence in the classroom. Given our significant intellectual and practical investment in these areas, our campus is the ideal site for this afternoon's conversation to take place. I'm honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Kathy Davidson. Dr. Davidson is the Ruth F. DeVarney Professor of English and John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies at Duke University. She was Duke's first Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies, serving in that position until 2006. She's co-founder of Haystack, the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Advanced Collaboratory which is a network of educators dedicated to new models of learning for the digital age. In addition, Dr. Davidson is past president of the American Studies Association and a former editor of the journal American Literature. She currently co-directs the annual Haystack MacArthur Foundation Digital Media and Learning Competitions. Last but not least, in June, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to the National Council on Humanities. This afternoon, Dr. Davidson will show us something of the analytical and visionary qualities for which she is celebrated and in such high demand as a speaker. Her talk, Now You See It, Attention and the Future of Learning, is on the same subject as her similarly titled book published earlier this year. Some of us accept digital innovation in schools and workplaces, whether grudgingly, half-heartedly, or enthusiastically. Others are preoccupied with what they fear are detrimental effects on individuals and society as a whole. Dr. Davidson takes a third, more forward-looking position, seeing the immense possibilities for digital devices, research, and communication to make today's education and work environments more responsive to our 21st century needs. To her great credit, her vision does not come out of thin air, but rather is rigorously grounded in current interdisciplinary research. For example, Using research on the brain and learning, she shows how the phenomenon attention blindness shapes our lives, with the result that many of our schools and workplaces are now largely out of step with who we are and how we think. It would be enough if Dr. Davidson's work helped us to see our current situation more deeply and with deeper understanding. But to our great good fortune, her work also shows us not only how we can survive our brave new digital future, but also thrive in it. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davidson. Well, 
it is just fabulous to be here. I'm um, among friends. Um, I, I've been to Davis several times now. Um, love it here. About to celebrate my 10th wedding anniversary here. We were married on the beach at Point Reyes. Uh, and Thursday we're going to be unwired, unplugged for, ten, for three days and, and celebrate that. Um, also, um, later I'm going to be talking with your dean, uh, my former colleague, uh, Ron Mangan. Uh, when I was vice provost, we helped, we created the, our new Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, and I had the privilege of reading the dossiers of the world's most brilliant, interesting, uh, creative neuroscientists, and we chose Ron to come to Duke to start our program. You guys got him back again, so um, I won't hold it against you. Um, he did a brilliant job at, at Duke, and I know he is here as well. But it was actually, uh, I say this in the book too, he's partly the fault of this whole new project um, I embarked on. Because it was 10 years ago, uh, actually or longer than that, 1999, when I was reading dossiers of all these neuroscientists, literally everybody um, that we could find in the world, and reading all these interesting things about the human brain. At the same time, I was reading very banal, very banal uh, punditry which has only gotten worse, not better, about how the internet was destroying our brain. And it was like, wait, here I've got the best neuroscientists telling me all this interesting information about the brain, and these wizards trying to tell us that the, brain, that the age we live in is damaging our brains. Uh, you can tell me that my brain is being distracted. You can tell me I'm becoming lonely because of the internet. You can tell me I've got too much to do because of the internet. No, that's okay. Don't tell me the internet is damaging, which is a word that's often used, my brain, or worse, my kids' brains. That to me is an irresponsible and evil, even evil thing to do. Because who in this room hasn't been, whose life hasn't been changed in some way by the internet? So partly what motivated this book was a sense that I've been privileged to read work like Ron's and other neuroscientists in the world. I can understand a little bit of what they're saying, and I can help to try to be a translator to correct what I think is a really bad tendency in a lot of the punditry and even demagoguery that's coming out and try to be a little more helpful for all of us today. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is, is exactly that. Um, you're also going to be helping me on this talk today. Uh, you'll find there's a little card and a pencil on every seat. Um, I'm going to set this up a bit, but pretty soon you're going to have a little home. I've got a timer. Um, the very eminent historian Robert Darnton says that in all human history, there have only been four great information ages where the very terms of the way we communicate and interact with one, or, one another have been changed irrevocably and in a way that it pervades virtually everything humans do. Now, when Darton says this, he goes back to ancient Mesopotamia, 4,000 years ago, to the invention of writing as the first great information age. And skipping ahead to the classical period, you probably know that Socrates hated it. He wanted nothing to do with writing, right? Plato transcribed Socrates' dialogues, but Socrates himself thought that, that, that writing distracted you, hurt your memory. Probably he, if he had used that, if he had been in a more neuroscientific age, he would have said it damaged your brain. Right? So that's interesting to remember. Second great information age in human history, it starts in 10th century China and in uh, Europe with the Renaissance and with Gutenberg, the invention of movable type. There were people who didn't like that one either and who said that that meant that the scriptorium, that privileged world of the monk that chose which text to write down was being popularized by this thing called movable type that allowed you to reproduce type. The third great information age is the one actually where um, I began my career. And that's about the time of the founding fathers in the United States. And that's the invention of mass printing, machine-made paper, machine-made ink, the industrial age, which makes books available to middle class and working class people for the first time in human history. And no one liked that one either. Um, in fact, part of my research was going into historical societies and finding the little duodecimos, the cheap little books that were produced for the industrial age. And I found um, these little funny pockets in the dresses and the pants of the clothes of the time and started reading in diaries and realized young people were making these pockets to hide their duodecimos away from their parents. They were the video games of the 18th century, right? They were the thing you weren't supposed to do. They were what were ruining you, right? These books, how dare they? 
virtually, and this is the argument I'm going to make today, virtually everything we know about as education and as work was institutionalized for that information age. Okay. We're now living in what you could call, what Darton calls, and I would agree, it's the fourth great information age in human history. Right? The broadcast yourself uh, age where you can have an idea, you can go to your computer, you can print that idea, and virtually anyone with a connection can read what you've printed without mediation of an editor, without mediation of somebody else telling you that is or isn't worthy to be published, right? Think about that kind of power. And what I want to talk about today is what kinds of skills, what new forms of attention we need for this world and what skills our kids need, our students need for this world where you can have an idea, broadcast an idea on YouTube, on Facebook, on email, texting, uh, you name it. All of that is available pretty cheap for a very large percentage of the world, a larger percent through mobile phones. I do lots of projects in Africa and India with the, some of the poorest people on earth who, have, who are doing their business on mobile phones, including selling sheep and goats, um, using transactions and microcredit on mobile phones. Um, but how have we, we have these institutions for one era training kids for this new era. But before I say any more, I'm going to turn this over to you. You have these cards, you have these pencils, and I have a timer. I'm setting the timer for one and a half minutes, 90 seconds. On the card, I'd like you to write the three things. This, this is a three-part exercise, so make sure you do it. The three things, the three skills you think are most important for a college student today to master in order to thrive in the world that they will face when they graduate. Okay. So I'm setting it. Um, go for it. Three skills that you think are the most important for college students today in order to thrive in the world that they will be living in as adults. Okay, my powerful timer is now going off. You have no, how, no idea how hard it is to stand up here into a room that quiet when you're supposed to be the speaker for a minute and a half. It feels like, you know, like two hours. Okay, part two. I'm going to set the timer again, a minute and a half. I'd like you to turn to somebody, ideally someone you did not walk in with. Look at the six things on your cards, three people, three card, if you, if, you, if you walked in with them, that's fine. Uh, but look at the three things on each of your card, and in the next minute and a half, think about which you think is the single most important skill among the six that you've come up with together for a college student to master today.
Okay, 90 seconds. Timer, uh, 90 seconds, please. Thank you, 90 seconds, thank you. Okay, um, that little thing we just did, this kind of makes my argument for me. Um, thank you, <laughs> you helped. Uh, but there are a bunch of things I want to point out, and then we're going to be coming back to that, to that little exercise again at the end of the talk. One, isn't it interesting that when I asked first time to write three things on a card, the room went dead silent. I did not give the instructions to write alone. If you were Navajo or if this were Jap Japan, um, that would not have happened, right? So that's the first thing. We have been conditioned to think the timed test, the silent individual timed test, right, is the standard by which we measure intelligence in our world. That's culture. That's history. Okay. Two, can you think about the difference in the feel of the room? If someone had a machine in the room that could test the energy level, the difference in the energy level when everybody was talking? Right? And I had, and it took a lot longer, right? I had to tell people to please stop, right? Um, three, every pedagogical, every pedagogical study says if a year from now you're asked what happened at Kathy Davidson's lecture, what you're going to remember is what happened in the second event, right? Because the more you're involved, brain, writing, conversation, negotiating, process. Socrates was not wrong. He was a smart guy, that Socrates, right? Process is the best learning mechanism, right? Um, also, all the research shows that when you go back and look at what you wrote down a year from now, you're all going to remember that it was your idea that got circled as the smartest one, because that, <laughs> that's, what, that's what memory is, that's what history is. Any historian says that history is taking the moment of now and thinking back to what the moment of then was, reflected in the moment of now, I the historian. So that's, that's interesting too. The final point I want to make is no brain was damaged in the course of that second experiment, <laughs> right? It was a pretty noisy room. For many of you, you were talking to somebody you didn't know. You were negotiating on an assignment you'd never heard before I made it, and you were having to negotiate which idea was the best idea. You were in a contest with somebody else or a collaboration with somebody else, some kind of interaction with somebody else to look at mutual ideas and decide which is best. That's multitasking on all kinds of different levels, emotional, cognitive, physiological, auditory, sensory. No brains were damaged in the course of that experience. We have such an impoverished idea of what multitasking is, right? We have such an impoverished idea of what attention is. It's one, another one of the reasons that I'm interested in the science of attention, is to get rid of a lot of myths and to help all of us relax a little about the state of our, co our cognitive state so we can use this amazing tool called the internet in a good way, in a positive way, in a productive way. It's not going to solve our problems and it's not going to damage our brain. So what can we do to use it well? How many people know this ex experiment? Know what I'm doing? Okay, great. So I'll do it very, very quickly. It's probably the most famous experiment now in cognitive neuroscience, although when it was first done in the 70s, everyone said, if you go back and read the reviews in the 70s, everyone said it was done by Ulrich Lieser, one of the founders of cognitive and perceptual psychology. Everyone said it was going to transform the way humans thought about themselves. Didn't, right? It was reprised in 1999 by two young people at Harvard, Dan Simons and Chris Chabris, who was a graduate student at the time at Harvard, because they had better technology, they had digital technology, and they said, maybe if we get the technology right, It'll have the impact. What this assignment, it does, what this experiment does, is it makes us aware of our own attention blindness. Uh, for those who don't know it, it's a video that's two minutes long. This is a still from a two-minute-long video of these ki these young graduate students at Harvard passing basketballs back and forth. Uh, you, as tester, as test participants, are asked to count how many times the ball is passed only between people wearing black, right? Not white, only between somebody wearing black. Uh, about halfway through the video, a young undergraduate at Harvard, who they dressed up in a gorilla suit, walks in among the circle, is on camera for nine seconds. She beats her chest, she makes a face at the camera, and she walks away. Okay. About 60%, a little less than 60% of test subjects who, who are seeing the video for the first time 
do not see the gorilla. Right? They might have gotten a perfect score, 15 passes. They do not see the gorilla. Right? About 100% of people who weren't there to see the experiment are sure that if they saw it, they would see the gorilla. Right? <laughs> the whole point is we believe we see the world. We see what we're focused on. That's an incredibly powerful part of the human brain, to be able to focus. But to focus means to unfocus everything that we're not counting. So if we're told to count the number of passes, we do. It's like the time test, right? But we miss a lot. And most of us miss the gorilla. There's dozens of these experiments. I saw the gorilla the first time. It's not because I'm good at this. I'm not. I've taken, I think, every attention test there is, and I've failed them all. The reason I saw it this day, and this is relevant to what we're talking about, is because it was my office when I was vice provost that was putting on the lecture where a young cognitive neuroscientist was talking about this experiment. So I wasn't paying attention to the video. I was seeing, is the caterer coming? Who's coming? Does everyone have a seat? Um, also, I'm dyslexic. So this is complicated for me to count basketball tosses in a, in a complicated situation. So I thought, bag it. Forget it. No way. I've got more important things to do. This is, I'm a vice provost. This is my event. I'm not going to watch. So I saw the gorilla. Now, this was an event for distinguished professors at Duke. Everybody got a perfect count. Because, right, that's what distinguished professors do, right? They're told to do something. It's an academic setting. They get a perfect score. I would guess there were only three people out of about 200 that saw the gorilla that day. Now, however surprising it is to be told that you missed a gorilla, right? It's even weirder to be in a room of 200 people and realize no one is seeing the gorilla, okay? That's institutional lesson number one, okay? If you're trying to make an institutional change and there's some crazy gal who's telling you they're seeing a gorilla, don't always assume they're wrong, even if 199 of the other 200 people are convinced that there's no gorilla, okay? So that's the first lesson of attention blindness. We cannot see what we cannot see, right? Unless, and that's the other method I, and the, the, one of the points I'm going to be making today, unless we delegate the right partners, the right tools, and the right methodology to privilege diversity, difference, opposite points of view, and it has to be privileged or often, and again, all the research shows this, collaboration tends to mediate towards the status quo. You have to set up special conditions for privileging the different voices. Now, you may know this. This is how the World Wide Web was created, right? One of the people I was privileged to talk to in writing this book was Tim Berners-Lee, who wrote the HTML for the World Wide Web. The, 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 uh, if there's any techie geeks in the audience, you all know this. It's the Bible phrase of of all of us who are in, involved in uh, the open web. It's Eric Raymond's famous phrase from the cathedral in the bar. It's a funny phrase. With enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Does everyone, do you know? That's what, what that means is, if we all write computer code from the same point of view, we're not gonna catch the bugs. If you have enough people around the world contributing to the development of code. This is how the World Wide Web was created. If you have an open system that allows people from massively different cultures, training, perspectives, credentials, expertise to contribute, you have a chance of seeing the bugs that those people who share the same, same um, expertise miss. So the people in CERN and the people at MIT who are writing HTML constantly were missing the bugs. The dropout, the 16-year-old dropout in Tokyo, kept seeing all these bugs. That 16-year-old dropout now runs the Media Lab at, at, um, at Harvard. But at the time, he was a kid. He was a hacker. And they at first said, who is this kid? We don't know him. He has no credentials. And then they said, but he's the one that keeps finding the things that are bringing down our system. Okay? So a system that privileges diversity, openness, and divided expertise allows you to start seeing the gorilla. Nothing about the research university, I mean, that's silly. Very little about the research university of today is designed to privilege the eccentric, non-credentialed, 
non-expert outlier voice. And there's a reason for that, right? Clay Shirky, the media theorist Clay Shirky says, institutions tend to preserve the problem they were created to solve. Institutions tend to preserve the problem they were created to solve. The research university was created to solve a lot of problems in the late 19th century, right? It was the, great, the time of the great second industrial revolution, Taylorism, Fordism, mass producing, and it was a time where people were desperately um, and urgently trying to create the kind of expertise for the modern world of the 19th century. Oh, did I, that's, I skipped one. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, these are some of the things that are the words that are the most important words um, that for which the research university is trying to solve problems. How do we control attention? How do we focus attention? Timeliness, uh, going back a little bit to the um, creation of, the, uh, pu of public schooling. Um, the school bell, of course, is a symbol of the public school in the 19th century. Why? Because you had to get farmers to understand it didn't matter when the sun came up. They had to start on time. Right? So everything about public schooling that's part of, the, of common schooling is about timeliness. It's math hour. It's reading hour. It's writing hour. Really? I, haven't fi I don't understand it yet. Doesn't matter. Put away your school books. Take out another one. The times test. Right? Hierarchy. Who is telling you what to do? Again, if you're an artisan or a farmer, who tells you to shoe the horse? Who tells you to fix the fence? Right? That's really different than the factory where somebody is telling you, you do this, you do this task, you do it over and over again, you do it on time, and you do it to it for a purpose. Specialization, expertise, credentials. Who gets to tell the person, you do this, you do it on time? What credentials do you have to have to be the person who tells you, you do this, you do it on time? Metrics. How do you decide what is or is not productive? It isn't that I've got enough hay to bring to market this year. Right? That my, I'm, so I'm feeding my family. It's I'm getting profits for the company I'm working for that might be way removed from my job putting a cog in this, in this particular um, piece or doing some very, very small part of the manufacturing process. Two cultures, right? Before the 19th century, I mean, math, I mean you know, if you're Pythagoras, mathematics is, a, is part of the humanities, right? This idea that the human and social scientists, sciences are over here and the um, uh, natural and physical sciences are this different thing. It's a really odd formation in the idea of intelligence, human intelligence. Now we get to this slide. Excuse me. There are many, many important thinkers um, who contribute to what becomes the research university and, and as well as modern education in the 20th century. But the two I'm fascinated by and want to put together in very um, clear ways are William James and Frederick Winslow Taylor. Um, in chapter 11 of The Principles of Psychology, uh, William James whines that nobody else in English has written about attention. He's the first person in English to write about attention. He has a whole chapter on it. And he says, I'm the first person to write about what that thing that the French call distraction. Okay. I was an AI kid, uh, artificial intelligence kid, so I've been reading William James since I was a teenager. I never, until I wrote this book, saw that phrase before. It just jumped out at me. What the French call distraction? Really? 1890? What the French call distraction? Now, etymologically, in fact, the word distraction has been in English for a long time. But in that use, which is attention is this thing, this focused, linear, undivided thing that gets distracted from outside. He, James had to borrow the French usage. That's interesting, right? That's interesting that, we're, um, that, we're, um, that we had to borrow that concept, that it's a relatively new concept um, for us in English. Um, Almost all research, Singer and Klinger are, are, they're not related, Singer and Klinger are two exceptions, but much until about 10 years ago, almost all the research on attention in the 20th century is about attention that's, dis Jamesian attention, attention that's in the West, I mean, that's distracted from the outside. 
It's very interesting because almost all the research on attention in the East is about how the mind causes its own distraction. Right? And we now know from the, work, the Cambridge scientists and the work that's being done at Washington U and other work, about 80% of, of the brain's energy is used in talking to itself. If you've ever had insomnia, you know what I mean, right? If you've ever tried to meditate, you know what I mean, right? And that's, of course, why in Eastern traditions they've studied the mind's distractions, because here's a culture that says the highest form of human knowledge and learning and attention is going into that space where there are no external distractions, looking inward, thinking about mindfulness and, and being. And if you do it really well, you become a Buddha, and there aren't very many Buddhas in the world, right? Why? Because when you're in that undistracted space, your mind goes crazy. Right? Howard Rheingold, the great media theorist, does this wonderful experiment with his students at Stanford where he says, okay, close your cell phones, close your laptops, now close your eyes. And he has students sit for five minutes in the silence behind their own eyelids. And then he has them open their eyes and try to write down in linear form what happened in five undistracted minutes and no one can do it. Your brain's multitasking all over the place, right? Taylor not only builds on the idea of linear controlled attract, um, attention, he starts to measure it, right? He's interested in physical, in the physical way of productivity. He's the father of, this, of scientific labor management. He's been called one of them by, um, uh, oh, the famous labor, uh, Dr uh, Drucker, the famous labor guru, I'm, I'm forgetting, Peter Drucker, the most important thinker since the founding fathers, okay? Because what Taylor did was said, we have to have metrics for measuring who's a good worker and who isn't a good worker. This isn't any more about whether you can feed your family, it's about are you producing enough. Interestingly, about three years ago, someone went back and looked at his diaries, and it turns out that Taylor was faking all of his data, which is, fa I mean, I think that's pretty fascinating. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This has had profound influence on not just our work lives, not just on every human resource department in the country, but on how we teach at research universities. Um, this is a funny slide. You don't have to look at the whole thing. Um, perspective. The basic um, compulsory public education movement basically goes from Massachusetts uh, to Mississippi. From 1852 to 1918, every state requires compulsory education. Interestingly, every one of them requires that every kid start at, at a specific age, at age six. When in human history, and anyone who's a parent knows this, has it been thought that you should have every kid start school at the same age? Isn't that weird? I mean, it's just a, it's an eccentric idea of intelligence, right? That every kid should be ready for, we all know, right? A four-year-old might be ready one time, an eight-year-old might not be ready. But that's a fundamental in compulsory education in America. Um, if you read biographies before that, you know, um, Cotton Mather graduates from Harvard at 13, you know, there's all kinds of variation. We uniform and standardize the age of learning. These other things are mostly things that get developed basically in the period of James, uh, William James and um, uh, Frederick Winslow, T Winslow Taylor, right? And the metrics that are being developed are being developed at the same time as the methods of the research university, which is created in the late 19th century. I'm, I don't have time today to talk about all of them, so I'm just gonna talk about two little things here, grades and multiple choice tests. So they're both very important to the lives we lead. Grades. Mount Holyoke is the first university to, to go to an ABCD grading system in 1897. The second organization to go to an ABCD grading system is the American Meatpackers Association. <laughs> I went back and looked at the archives of the American Meatpackers Association when, they're, when they were deciding to go to an ABCD grade, and they were upset about it. They said grades were far too simplistic. You're going to take everything about sirloin and chuck and reduce it to an A, B, C, D grade? Okay. Uh, educators didn't seem to have that problem, right? Because within a decade, almost every university and college is going to an A, B, C, D grading system. Interesting, right? Interesting. Uh, multiple choice tests. 
Um, as you know, since 2002, we've had a national educational policy called No Child Left Behind, which leaves a lot of kids behind. And one of its features is that every child has to take an end of grade test, which is a multiple choice test, right? Timed, timed, start at the same time, take out your paper, fill in the bubble, make sure you fill it in completely, end it at the same time. Uh, items that are tested with, with answers you choose A, B, C, D, or none of the above, or all of the above. So um, that's our national educational policy now. Um, my editor, 30-year-old editor, said, Kathy, you keep whining about multiple choice tests. Who invented the multiple choice test? It never occurred to me there was a person that invented the multiple choice test. I was sure there was, that it had evolved. There was a person who invented the multiple choice test. His name is Frederick Kelly. It's 1914. There's a war on. Men are at war. Women are in the factories. Hundreds of thousands of new immigrants are coming to America. And Congress has recently passed legislation making two years of high school required for all Americans. Okay, before that high school was college prep. There's a crisis. So Frederick Kelly's writing a dissertation at Kansas State Teachers College. And he says, I have an idea. We have a national crisis, but Ford is turning out Model T's on an assembly line. I bet we can come up with a test that will get people through two years of higher education in the same way we get out, we turn out those Model Ts. We have a crisis, we have to deal with it. He invents the Kansas silent reading test or the item response test. I'm gonna, here's a question. Here's, this is on the Kansas, this is almost verbatim. Which of these animals is a farm animal? Dog, cow, dinosaur, crocodile. Does that, does that surprise, I mean, have, have, okay. Has not everybody in this class had to take that question? I mean, in this, in this, in this group, at class, that was funny. <laughs> in this room had to take a question or seen their kid take a question like that? Okay, lots of interesting things about that question. One, if you're a farm kid, why isn't a dog a farm animal, right? Doing well, and we know this, we have the research. Doing well on item response tests is not about intelligence. It's about being trained to figure out what the test requires, what's often called teaching to the test, right? Um, after I wrote this book, I heard from a marvelous person who's going around to very, very poor schools in the United States, so-called failing schools, you know, by this heinous uh, No Child Left Behind policy that we've got a little bit of a reprieve from, thanks to Arne Duncan and, and uh, President Obama this summer, we've got a little bit of a reprieve. But the way the law is written in 2014, if your school is failing, the majority of your school students are getting below than below passing grades on the end of grade test. Your school will either be closed down or privatized. 2014, schools' teachers' salaries are being penalized if their kids aren't, you know, if their kids are failing. Um, this is a person who's gone around, an ethnographer who's gone around and interviewed the kids at failing schools. They know the content. They know the answers on the test. So then his follow-up is well, why didn't you get the test right? And they were like, those, those tests are stupid. No one wants, those are dumb tests. But, and those are only for tests, tests for kids who are going to college. Think about it. When people administer the test, they never say, you're taking this test because it's brilliant, because it's wonderful. They say, you're taking this test because if you do well on this test, you're gonna get a scholarship to school. It's a slight, it's a slap in the face of kids who know they can't go to school. He's doing, he, this is new research, so he's asked me not to use his name, although he blogged on it, on my, he wrote about it on my blog. But I think it's gonna be real, motivation, in other words, is key to that, to that. But Frederick Kelly, in 1914, didn't care about motivation. He had to get people through the school system. So he got his dissertation, the war ended, the situation stabilized, and he renounced multiple choice testing because he said, and I'm not, this is not a phrase I would use, I'm quoting him, the test is, a test of lower order thinking for the lower orders, quote unquote. Okay. Not for smart people, not for affluent people, right? It, had, it was a crisis. He goes on to become president of the University of Idaho. And he's a Dewey-esque thinking and doing, problem solving, collaboration, uh, uh, this, this interesting person, and he gets fired in two years because they hired the person that invented the multiple choice test, 
which by the time he becomes president of the University of Idaho, is the way college entrance exams, the Scholastic Aptitude Association, uh, Testing Association, is formulated in 1928 and uses Frederick Kelly's item response test as its metric for who goes into college. Kind of interesting, right? That that's our legacy? Virtually everything on this sheet is part of what makes up the apparatus of our educational system from kindergarten to LSATs, MCATs, you know. Americans test more often than any other country on earth, earlier than any country on earth, and put more weight on multiple choice tests than any other country on earth. And it's our gift to the world, because now most other countries use it. Okay. Learning for participation in the World Wide Web. I'm not sure that that kid who goes home from school crying because he failed the dog, cow, crocodile, dinosaur test today is being served very well by the multiple choice test. Because if I'm a parent and my kid wrote dog instead of cow, I might well say, well, Google farm animals and learn a little about farm animals. I've done this. If you Google farm animals, you don't get four choices you get 21,900,000 items. What about A, B, C, D, or even all of the above possibly prepares a child today to understand a world of 21,900,000 options? Right. The number one ranked item on Google right now, if you look up farm animals, is this amazing site called Farm Kids. I'm, I'm not exactly six years old anymore, and I spent an hour on it. It's a delightful site made by educators, a delightful site, all about farm animals, interactive, interesting, except if you don't have the most recent Microsoft Internet Explorer, if you happen to have an Apple or use an open source browser like the Firefox browser, it doesn't work. So. What about, so in other words, it's a proprietary site and you have to look closely and far within the guts to see that it's a Microsoft proprietary site. What about our ABCD educational system prepares kids to be skeptical about the abundance of information in the world, to be critical about that information, to think about who's giving me that information, for what reason, why, and how. I don't think that's different for college kids. I'm not even sure it's different for us as adults, uh, right? Um, and we are not doing a very good job preparing kids either for the information avalanche at their disposal, for uh, being able to produce and contribute to the interdisciplinary, um, uh, the um, information avalanche, or for the problems that are embedded, like proprietariness, but many other problems of security, privacy, uh, intellectual property, copyright issues, all kinds of issues that are problems of the age in which they live. When I was originally making this talk, I um, had a list of things I thought were important for the 21st century, and I thought, well, that's a, you are a hypocrite, Davidson. You know, why? I've just said that we're in this interactive age of where we need collaboration and new ways of paying attention. If I say these are the six things to pay attention to, you're going to be missing gorillas, right? You know, that's just how it works. So instead of um, saying what I think is important, I'm going to give you two examples, and then I want to return to the idea of what's on your card. Here are two learning examples um, that I think are pretty interesting. One I'm responsible for, I'm partly responsible for, so of course I think it's interesting. Um, and it's gotten a lot of airplay yes, uh, recently because yesterday was the 10th anniversary of the iPod. Um, nine years ago, Apple came, actually 10 years ago, Apple came to us and said, at Duke and said, we've got this new idea called the Apple Digital Campus. We have a new initiative and um, we'd like Duke to participate. Which of our technologies would you like to give out to your students for educational purposes? And I got together with the other provosts and vice provosts and deans and we came up with the idea of the iPod. It was brand new. There was not a single known educational use for the iPod. Do you remember? And every kid in America wanted them, right? They were everywhere. They were like, whoa, one day they were everywhere. And do you remember the signs from those huge billboards with the bright colors and, and silhouettes and people, their kids are dancing with their hair flying? We said, what if we gave every freshman an iPod? 
every first year student a free iPod, free, whatever, you know, Duke tuition is, nothing's free, but a free iPod. So we gave every first year student a free iPod. And instantly, the second, third, and fourth year students were furious. <laughs> Right? We paid tuition. How come we didn't get it? And we said, oh my goodness, we made such a terrible mistake. How about this? If, you, if any second, third, or fourth year student can come up with an educational use for the iPod and find a professor who's willing to change their syllabus to include the iPod in their syllabus, we'll give you, the professor, and everybody in the class a free Duke-branded iPod. Well, it's really interesting because within one semester, we gave away more iPods to students who had convinced faculty to change their syllabus to include an educational use of the iPod. And, and for reasons of time, I won't tell you what those are, but let's just say it was everything from hard arrhythmias to dropping your solo into the Philadelphia Harmonic to create, having the world's first podcasting conference at Duke. It was a student conference. I found the poster for it, and podcasting is in quotation marks, so we didn't know what to call it. Steve Jobs was no fool. He got a lot of free and R&D out of this. We gave more iPods for that reason, because students had come up with genuine, interesting, invaluable R&D for Apple, but also interesting uses for the iPod, but more important, and this was pretty amazing, Faculty were willing to listen to their students and change their syllabus? How often does that happen, right? In fact, if I, as a vice provost, had said, we're, this is the digital age, you must all go forth, faculty, and do something digital in your classes, no one would have done it, right? Maybe Ron, <laughs> but, but most people, most faculty would have been dug in their heels. Administrators are always telling us to do this new thing. This is ridiculous. But students were doing it, and the faculty did it. They went along. Interestingly, that Times Higher Ed just asked me to write about this, and I wrote about this story again, and the, it, the um, executive at Apple, who had, was a response for this, wrote this great comment about how amazed he was, and Apple was, that when we did this experiment, we were vilified. Oh my God, the hate mail was crazy. We were on NBC News. We were vilified in the, in the Chronicle of Higher Education. We were vilified in the New York Times. I mean, we were, t this was just thought, the worst thing in the world when we did this experiment. When it turned out to be a phenomenally interesting, there was no department that didn't have something important happen because of that experiment that was then used uh, and incorporated. Silence. So I wrote to the Apple guy and I said, you know, after he put the, he wrote that information in the, uh, as a comment, and I wrote to him and I said, wow, that's interesting. He said, yeah, you keep saying, he's been following me, he's a stalker, he's been following me, and he said, you've been saying that the biggest thing that we got out of that experiment at Apple was all that free R&D. Actually what we got, this is really depressing and a sad thing, and I think we all need to take this to heart, what we got was the realization that if we tried to take a new product and say it was going to re revolutionize education, we'd get hate, and when we were right, we'd get silence. So you will notice that in no Apple campaign is formal education the center of the product campaign. He said, that's the money we saved, right? We knew that was, that was not the right argument, uh, uh, that was not the right audience. That's, talk, talk to parents about their little kids, talk to people how fun it is, but don't dare to say some new technology could change education because you're just going to get negatives. It's not going to work. It's going to fail. Okay. So that's, 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 that's uh, allegory number one of education in the Internet age. Two is somebody who, I don't, he doesn't have a college degree and I suspect he doesn't have a high school degree. Um, in writing this book, I wanted to find somebody whose life probably wasn't touched at all by the Internet, so I stupidly, because I'm not a builder, thought, well, building trades. How much have those been? Those really haven't changed much by the Internet, have they? And I'm driving along one day, and there on NPR is an interview with this man named Dennis Quaintance, a developer in Greensboro, North Carolina, talking about building a hotel in Greensboro, a $30 million hotel in Greensboro. And I called Dennis, and I interviewed and spent time with Dennis because it turned out he had a $30 million project he was doing. He's a very successful developer in a small southern city. He and his wife were 40 when their twins were born. They were walking along the canal one day talking about what their kids would think of them when they grow up. And Dennis's wife said, 
they're going to be proud of our achievement. We give back to our community. We're good people. But what about inv the environment? And Dennis realized he had never done any building project that was sustainable. So he got this idea and he called his 60 core people that had built all of the projects in Greensboro he'd done before. And he said, what if we tried to build a sustainable hotel? No, none of these people, none of these people knew what that was. He said, and I'm going to do something special. Normally, he's a, he's a tough-minded businessman, very successful. He said, normally, I do everything on a cost plus contract. That means if you get in late, you pay a double penalty. If, it goes, if there's a cost overrun, you pay a double penalty. For this project, I'm going to take off the plus part. If you come up with sustainable electricity, sustainable plumbing, sustainable elevators, sustainable HVAC, and it takes a little more, it goes over budget, you have to assume that, that part, but I'm not going to penalize you. And he said, and what we're going to do is we're each going to take our interest, with enough eyeballs, all, all bugs are shallow, we're going to each take our specialization and learn everything. We're going to go on the internet, we're going to learn everything we can about sustainable development. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about it. So he said they had toilet of a week, uh, toilet of the week at, the, for a, at one time, where they had every sustainable toilet and they were all testing them out. Right? Again, these are not college professors. These are not environmental engineers. These are ordinary people. They built this hotel they called the Proximity Hotel because they decided that actually the most sustainable thing they could do was retrain local craftspeople to build and to do and to help using these methods on this hotel. So proximity means everybody was nearby. At some point, the organization that gives sustainability awards, LEAD, heard about this project and said, are you tracking? And Dennis said, oh, of course, we're tracking everything because we want other people to learn as we're learning. After the hotel was built, LEAD came and gave Proximity Hotel in Greensboro, North Carolina, 60 people with no education in environmental science, America's only, first and only, platinum LEAD designation for a hotel, for a sustainable hotel only. So when I interviewed Dennis, I said, okay, so this is a different kind of learning. He's like, yeah, we didn't have any idea what we were doing. We were just learning from each other. We were just, and I said, well, well what's the big message that you can pass on to others? He said, the big, big message is both the saddest and the happiest thing I can tell you. It wasn't that difficult. Happiest because 60 people in Greensboro, North Carolina are now world famous. When the recession came, their hotel was still full because that hotel's been written about everywhere, right? And people want to stay in it. I've stayed in it. You've never felt air like in the Proximity Hotel. I mean, you feel like you're at the beach. It's a whole different concept of a non-toxic, sustainable environment with this amazing light and this amazing air, and it's gorgeous. It's, I'm a design snob. It's a gorgeous hotel. So that's the happy part. The sad part, he said, it wasn't that difficult, and we're the only one. That's sad. Clay Shirky says, institutions tend to preserve the problem they were designed, they were created to solve. I actually think we're all part of institutions, and that the worst thing about institutions is we buy into them and believe that they cannot be changed. So it isn't institutions that tend to preserve the problem they were created to solve. We are complicit in that, right? Here's Dennis Quaintance and 60 people in Greensboro, North Carolina with the America's only platinum lead hotel, and his message is, it wasn't that hard. Um, I don't think I have to tell anybody how to reform education for the 21st century. The buzz when you were talking among each other and the, whatever it was that you circled on your card seems to me like the starting point for a real conversation about what we need to do to change education now. And it's not about futurism, it's not about utopia, it's now, right? We're 15 years into the internet and that's the time in the history of technology when you've got a generation that says, I don't care about whether it was bef bad, better before. I want to know about this technology now and how it can be better for me now. I mean, does anyone know any 15-year-old that cares about what happened before they were born? <laughs> right? 
We're responsive to a generation of students that doesn't remember of before. If we're going to have any relevance at all, we have to be responsive to that. Yes, we're facing terrible, terrible cutbacks from outside. I don't think this kind of thinking requires money. I do think it's a tragedy that at this moment where innovation is so important that we're taking, we have such terrible priorities that education is being, our kids are being robbed of the education they deserve. That's a different issue, but it's a related issue. But we can all address this issue now. And that's, that's really all I have to say. I don't believe, I don't think it's that hard. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Davidson. Penetrating glimpse into both our past and our future. And um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Ron Meng, and Dean of Social Sciences. In fact, Dr. Davidson began that introduction, um, but not only because they've had a history, but uh, Ron's the perfect person to help uh, frame our engagement with this talk. Let me say a, just a few words about Ron. In addition to leading social sciences within the College of Letters and Science, Dean Mangan is a professor of psychology and neur uh, neurology, an international leader in cognitive neuroscience. He began his professional career in 1990 at Dartmouth College and Medical School in the program of cognitive neuroscience. In 1992, he joined the psychology department at UC Davis as one of the founding faculty members of the Center for Neuroscience. Uh, in 1999, he was tapped by Duke University to found and direct the Interdisciplinary Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. At Duke, he established one of the nation's most prominent programs for the study of the human brain and mind, recruiting award-winning scholars and developing a strong new graduate program in cognitive neuroscience. Fortunately for us, in, two, uh, in 2002, he was um, recruited back to UC Davis to found the Center for Mind and Brain a major new campus initiative which he directed until 2009. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go on and list all of its accomplishments, but I want to add a special set of words to talk about uh, Ron Mangan from Dr. Davidson. Um, I'm especially delighted that Ron Mangan, she said, who I probably was most singly responsible for bringing to Duke in 1999, is now your dean. There are few people whose work I admire more or have been more influential on my own thinking in the last decade. So, I will allow the two of you to share a stage. Thank you, Ralph. That was very sweet of you to say all those things my mother wrote. <laughs> Kathy, we're so happy you came to see us. I'm especially happy, of course, for all the reasons we've told everybody, but thank you for a lovely talk. It was really thought-provoking. Um, I've said since reading your book that, which I said this to several people hoping someone would agree with me, that's the book I should have written. And, <laughs> and the reason is it's because I'm an attention researcher, so I'm you know, part of all the interesting things she talked about and part of the problem probably also. But um, one of my former, recent former friends uh, retorted back and says, Ron, you're not an English professor and you couldn't have written that book. <laughs> So I'm happy to be here on stage <laughs> with the book in my hand, and I'm going to give myself a gift instead of giving you one. I'm going to let you sign this for me oh, later, cool. love to. if you would, would be please. Such an honor. Would be an honor. <laughs> so um, the thing that I really enjoyed about the book is I got so many ideas uh, in my, from my own research. Right. And you might think, how can that be? Because you've been doing this for 30 years. You're supposed to have some ideas, and you know, your students have all the ideas. But the answer is, is that when you read the book, about attention in a context that's more uh, broadly uh, written, um, affecting education and, and development and policy and so many different things, I started to think, are, are all these different arguments that she's making really true? I can test that. And so I've just, you know, so some of my lab members are in the audience, and I just wanted to give you a little heads up. <laughs> <laughs> so. so we're going to have a little question and answer period here. And I'm going to kick it off. And the rules of this answer, question and answer period are really only pretty much one, except for the obvious, don't go on too long, is that we have a microphone because this is being recorded today. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and then the micro give the microphone 
a second or two to wander over to you, and then, uh, then you can ask your question. And to let this get started, I'm going to ask the first question, and this is a simple test. So given what you've learned about attention from all your reading and studying and thinking, what's the number one change we should implement in college education? Okay, answer A is, the <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Uh, uh, you, I think we should do away with A, B, C, D. You go ahead and just free form answer and then I'll scan the audience for questions. I think the number one change is that um, we all need to stop and think about what that change should be. And I know that sounds slippery. That was D. But that was D. <laughs> but what I mean by that is, I think it's the moment where the first thing we need to do is take stock of what we have. Because the whole lesson of attention blindness is, is if we only are looking in one direction, we can't see what we're missing. Mm -hmm. But I think huge forums, or tiny forums, that involves students and teachers and alums and community members and people in the workplace. I give lots of talks now for um, businesses, all of whom agree with me, right? They all say, we hire these brilliant straight-A students and it takes a year and a half for them to understand they're not have, their job is not to give the right answer to me, the boss, but to think independently, but not just independently, collaboratively, especially people who are working on their own who don't have punch clocks anymore. 40% of IBM, IBM invented the punch clock, 40% of IBM workers no longer badge in, right? So I think the number one thing is a big taking of stock. If I could change K through 12 education, I would say, just for a year, give me one year, only one year with no end of grade testing. Every teacher I met said they teach brilliantly until March and then March to April, May is just about studying to the test. Just one year, give me with no end of grade testing and let, ki let teachers come up with really great challenges for students in that March to May period where they take everything they've learned that year and do something that will transform their community. Let little kids, even sixth graders, think about how what I've learned can transform my community. And let the teachers and students come up with a better way of testing the standards, the high standards of what people have learned. Just one year. If I could do anything for college education, it would be a year where nothing, no one went to class for a year, We'd all love that, right? Where no one went to class for a year and where we instead worked in study groups to really think about what we have and think about what we need for our institution, for our particular discipline, for our particular world that we live in and had that kind of introspection. And that, that to me would be the number one thing. No, no, no small thing. Thank you. No, we can do that tomorrow, right, Provost Rector? <laughs> so They'd <we're> love <laughs> that in, at the legislature, state legislature, wouldn't they? Where's our first question? Here we go. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's very enjoyable. Uh, well, if you don't mind me going into a bit of a specific area about something that could be changed, um, as you're probably aware, uh, one of the big buzzwords uh, that's around right now about uh, changing social interactions and things like education and personal improvement is gamification. The idea that you can make, for example, the educational process a bit more like uh, what you experience in games where instead of grades you have these sort of uh, cumulative, clearly defined achievements, um, among other things. That's just one part of it. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on that as a potential way to encourage uh, better thinking skills and um, cognitive abilities that are more in line with uh, the modern world rather than the 19th century industrial world. Um, I have a couple of responses to that. Um, one, in the chapter on how we measure, I profile some gamifiers, including a teacher in a three-room schoolhouse in Alberta, Canada, impoverished Alberta, Canada in the 60s and 70s, who um, every Friday would have the fifth and sixth graders compete against the fourth graders. And you know, so I think that the model, and I was trying to do that to get away from the idea that gamification is just about video games, right? games and tests and challenges are how we teach just about everything in the world except education, right? You know, if I have a little kid who takes their first step, I don't say, great, now you can have recess. I say, and now walk here, right? So you build upon past achievement. So, but I think the word gamification for, for fellow geeks, it's a great word, but for the world at large, it sounds like we're diminishing what we're talking, but I think learning based on challenges is basically what every great teacher does, and the sad thing about end of grade testing is it removes that which is our standard 
from the whole methodology of interactive testing, where you take someone's achievements and build on those achievements, where instead of giving people a reward of not working, you test them harder. So I'm a, I'm a huge believer in challenge-based testing in, um, um, oh, I'm forgetting the term. There's a, a better education, and, and just talent-based testing and real-time testing. I love tests. I mean, I think te gamification is basically constant testing, right? Everything is a test. I'm, play I'm learning how to play tennis. I missed the ball. I think I better practice a little. I'm going to hit against the wall, and then let's try to prevent. Then I'm going to beat you tomorrow, right? That's, that's how a great teacher teaches, and I think there's more of that. The phrase gamification has its own uh, so many issues um, that I think waylay the real seriousness of the basis of it, but I think it's, it's a great way. I, I did the meanest thing ever this year. Um, my poor dean. I wake up at four in the morning. I love to wake up and I love to come up with like crazy new things to do in my classes. And of course, because I believe in this, I blog about it. So he wakes up at eight o'clock and his phone is already ringing. <laughs> and it's somebody <laughs> complaining that I've done. But one of the things I did this year is instead of midterm exams, I did an innovation challenge like Mozilla would do to build you know, Mozilla Firefox browsers, where I had the students come up with a question, 20 students, had to turn in a final answer, 3,000 words that they published by midnight, and each one of them had to have contributed to it in a way that all the other students would attest that each person had, a trib had, a tri had, tri had contributed to it, and they all had to agree on the final answer. They thought it was going to be a piece of cake. I left town. I knew. <laughs> I mean, they, it was. I mean, there were. It was really intense, and it was amazing. I mean, and the students said they will never forget that experience. I mean, it's, you know, but that's gamification. But I didn't ever use that word. But. Questions. Here's one up here. Microphone is on its way. I enjoyed your talk tremendously. Thank you. Uh, what I'm wondering along similar lines, uh, more and more students are dropping out of mm -hmm. high school. Yes. And many of them, I'm convinced, uh, could have gone on to college. Yes. What concerns me, and I'm wondering if you're aware of any public uh, elementary or secondary school where they're beginning to focus in more on developmental age mm. rather mm. than chronological age Sounds because like there are some children and some high schoolers who really should be beyond their grade level, they're yes. bored silly, and there are others who are not ready for right. their grade level. Exactly. But it just seems to me they're losing a lot of youngsters yes. who are bored or not sufficiently challenged, right. and that affects the population Absolutely. of college goers. Absolutely. I think um, there are schools all over the country, there are special schools doing that, but it's certainly not part of our public educational system at all. Um, more boys are dropping out of school than girls. Um, I think you're totally right about developmental age. Um, both, you know, boredom is interesting because it's, it's um, not being challenged is the single most important contributor to dropping out of school for the smart kids, but also for the, adult, the kids that need more help. Because if something's way over your head, you're bored, right? You don't see where, it's, where it connects to you. So how to make things engaging at a child's own level, at their age level, but also their, so their, the field they're interested in, I think is so, so important. And that's one of the reasons why um, so many people are interested in gamification as a way of trying to challenge kids where they are instead of against a false metric. That's back to Taylor's idea of, you know, you're a soldier if you, if you can carry the pig iron this far in this much time. That's what we've adopted as the standard of education. And it's really the standardization of education. It's not the standard. That same child who might be way behind, if you took a different method or uh, respected his or her developmental level or knowledge level, could well turn out to be something special. Also, as we cut back education and we narrow the range of courses offered, so art and music, uh, are, or even physical education, and certainly what used to be called vocational training, are almost gone in schools. That, to me, is is absolutely tragic because it means people that had real, I mean, we need face-to-face, -face, there's all kinds of jobs that would be vocational training 
20 years ago that are face to face. They can't be computerized and they can't be offshored. Those kids now feel like failures. Of course they drop out of school. There would have been a world for them before. Who's picked up that slack? For-profit universities, some of which are criminal. They take our taxpayers' money in the form of Pew Grants. They have 75% dropout rates at some of them. They still collect the Pew Grants after the kids have dropped out. And why are they getting students? Because they offer the kind of classes that colleges don't offer anymore. It's a, real, it's a tragedy. It's a national tragedy and a, sh a disgrace, too. <clears throat> Thank you for the uh, excellent talk. Thank you. I have three questions. Uh, one uh, is one thing to teach um, uh, 20 students. It's another to teach 200 or 500. Do you have sp uh, specific suggestions or uh, ideas for new creative ways there? And, and second, uh, second? I'll just answer that one first. Okay, sure. There were 200 people in this room. Yeah. Right? You know, and I think more things like, you know, having people write on cards, students write on cards, and then talk together mm -hmm. in the classroom as part of the pedagogy is a cheat, it told, you know, the reason I do this is because it costs nothing, and it's, it, you can actually get interaction happening in a classroom, and you can do it with 200 students. You, I have friends that have done it with 1,800 students in a class. You can have that, ha that kind okay, of happen. Okay, that's, that's the interaction and so right. forth. But I mean, you still have to test 500 students and so forth. So and with a limited TAs. Yes. Okay, so, okay. Uh, second is, uh, what are the changes, uh, specific changes at Duke uh, that have uh, been implemented uh, in response to some of your ideas? And I'll go into the third one here and then I'll sit down. And that is, what's your uh, uh, views on online instruction uh, for the future right. of instruction? Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Um, some of the Duke ones, oh my gosh, we now, um, in the world of the, well, we have this great program in cognitive neuroscience, right, <laughs> that um, actually is a really interesting program that works across universities. Um, recently, the person, Hunt Willard, who runs our genome project, wrote an article for, um, I think it was in the England Journal of Medicine, where he said, Duke was the only university he's ever been at where the problem was for a genomic scientist. There were all these English teachers um, that he'd never heard of a place where there would be a multitude of English teachers wanting to work in genome sciences and vice versa. Uh, we've got uh, the humanities are now arranged around these humanities labs that are problem labs. And um, we have a Haiti lab this year that's also a global health program. When, um, dip, when um, cholera broke out in Haiti, some of the historians said, you know, I think we're right on this, but we need to do the research. We don't think cholera has ever been in Haiti before. And they were able to find 19th century ship records and find out that, in fact, there had not been cholera uh, in Haiti before and helped the um, Center for Disease Control pinpoint what the source of the cholera was based on past history of, of Haiti. So I would say one of the biggest things has been a kind of interdisciplinarity that is not a fake interdisciplinarity, but a really true collaborative interdisciplinarity that um, is pretty unusual. It's pretty unusual. There's also a world of student-led projects. There's a project called Duke Engage, where students um, can get a, some amount of college credit if they want it, or they can do it as extra credit. There's scholarships available to them, and to, to do this instead of um, um, uh, summer work for some of the students who are on scholarships where they take their learning from their classroom and employ and, and find a way to make it work in the community. So there's, I mean, I could tell, I'm, you know, I don't want to sound like, yay Duke, because that makes everyone disgusted and Duke's already the school everyone loves to hate, which I can't blame them for. I was never a Duke fan either. But anyway, uh, don't, oh, it's on camera. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's really pervasive. And I think that's, some people don't like that, but it's pretty pervasive. The third thing was online courses. There's some phenomenal ones. But right now, I mean, I gave this talk today. I talked to the New York Times today. I did an NPR show today. I was interviewed to be on the board of a major corporation today. Those things don't scare me. I think I'm gonna flunk freshman English. Um, I have a young boy, I'm a young college student, I'm helping to tutor because he's failed twice in freshman English. He goes to a for-profit school and he takes an online freshman composition class. He's failed it twice and I said, I'm, I can help you. I think I'm gonna fail. I think I'm gonna fail freshman composition. I'm gonna fail this kid who I promised I would help because it's this stupid, mindless program, which it turns out, I, I learned at dinner the other night from Karen and Eric, is very key to the way we teach writing now as part of No Child Left Behind. Every paragraph has to have a, a, a topic sentence, then two subtopic sentences. Then it can't be less than two sent sentences per paragraph. It has to be, it's terrible writing. I don't know, I've written 20 books. I don't know how to write that way. I'm gonna fail <laughs> this poor kid. 
You know, he came to me. You know, I promised him I'd help him. So there are great online classes. Um, the, there's, um, we worked just did this AI class at Stanford. Um, I was helping to put on this um, AI class. I, we were giving feedback on how we could work this as a, a class that anyone could take. We thought 200 people or maybe, first we thought 20, then we thought 200 people, 100,000 people signed up for this class. It's a pretty great class. You know, and anyone can take it. So there's great online classes. There's horrible ones. Uh, online classes, and so you know, I think it, 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 you know, that's all I can say about that. This is a really bad occasion to have to play the timekeeper, <laughs> but I, I will play that role. I often think there's, um, you know, it's rare for me to be able to bring anything from the study of medieval Latin, but I will point out that the same <laughs> word ludus means game and school. Absolutely. Um, we're very honored to um, have Dr. Davidson's new book. Now you see it, how the brain science of attention will transform the way we live, work, and learn, uh, available for your perusal in the lobby. I, I gather you can also purchase it. And in any event, Dr. Davidson has kindly agreed to be available to sign copies. Second, I want to remind you that this year's next Chancellor's Colloquium speaker is Dr. Charles Vest on Wednesday, November 30th. He's president of the National Academy of Engineering and president emeritus and professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. And finally, um, there's one final assignment. We've created an interactive learning environment out in the <laughs> courtyard, a reception at which you are all assigned to talk about this lecture. But first, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Add one other thing. Um, I've just made it a practice at any time I do a signing that my own personal royalties I always dedicate to a, a donate to a local cause, and the one I'm donating today's uh, royalties to is a wonderful organization called the California Organization for S Public School Libraries. The cutbacks in California have closed libraries and public schools, and this is a consortium of parents and former librarians and teachers who are literally going in and opening the libraries again, getting donated books, um, donated computers, and opening, and as volunteers, serving um, in public libraries throughout the state. And so, you know, it's, it's not a lot of proceeds, but all of those will go to that organization. I like to say that because it's important for all of us to know there's all ways that we can contribute in this world um, that don't cost a lot of money and that make a difference. And I think this is a local organization that's doing just that. Thank That's you. wonderful. Oh. That's really wonderful. <laughs>